Mr. Guy Keller, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Matt. How are you going? I am going great. Even though the uranium market is doing its best to change my mood, it won't be changed. Temporary, temporary holding pattern I'm going with. Um, look, we, today we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Oh, sorry, go on then. Any thoughts? I was going to say, <laughs> unless it's your fiscal year end in June like it's mine, then it hurts a little bit more. But anyways, ah, we'll, we'll get through it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think as American say, our thoughts and prayers are with you uh, on that one. <laughs> right. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Thank look, you. Look, look long, look long. Um, right, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff today. We're definitely going to a romp around the world at Athabasca um, Basin, some m and activity that's been happening, some uh, strange behavior by, by CEOs all, all around the world, money being raised. So it's, it's business as usual on, on that front. But I'm going to start off with, I saw something that you did, which was basically your thoughts on um, the coalition's nuclear energy proposal uh, in Australia. Some really quite cool things going on there. So maybe for people not that au fait with what's going on in Australia, its attitude to nuclear previously and maybe sort of a, a sort of changing landscape. Um, g- give us a kind of breakdown of that, and I might sort of tear in and ask a few questions along the way. Yeah, so, I mean, basically as part of a, a, a late-night deal uh, to push some legislation through in the John Howard era, uh, which also included uh, the refurbishment of the, the Lucas Heights Medical Nuclear Reactor uh, that sits in the outskirts of Sydney. Well, it's actually now it's not in the outskirts of Sydney; it's in suburban Sydney because Sydney sprawled into it. <clears throat> um, nuclear power was banned in Australia, uh, and at the time, then of course, you know, we had abundance of coal and coal-fired generation, and nobody cared about carbon, so it was fine. Um, you know, fast forward now, despite you know, uh, exporting uranium from three mines in South Australia. Uh, as I said, it, despite already having nuclear fission reactions going on in Lucas Heights, making radio uh, medical isotopes to, to save lives uh, in, uh, in medicine, um, we still have this nuclear ban. And of course, um, it's meant that uh, when you are looking at solutions to shut down coal, uh, you're excluding uh, the only source of base load electricity that's green. Um, and uh, and so, you know, the coalition came out with its policy. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a, an election uh, debate. Uh, the, the current federal government's trying to, uh, to be 82% renewables. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't take much to, uh, to look at examples in Germany and, uh, and California to, to understand that that potentially uh, doesn't work necessarily. Although we have an abundance of solar and wind resources, so we're different. Um, and so they've proposed a, uh, a, a policy to, to pick five coal-fired generation sites on the east coast of Australia, um, one in South Australia and one in Western Australia, uh, to put nuclear power on. Uh, and they say that they're going to be, they'll have the first one done by 2035 to 37, which is a little bit ambitious. Um, but it's caused a a huge amount of public opinion here uh, and the federal government um, and again and again sorry we're, we're getting nuclear submarines from the UK and the US under this AUKUS deal so we will have a nuclear industry and we will have to deal with the uh, the, the, the spent fuel and things that goes with that um, in the future however we can't produce carbon free electricity from it <laughs> um, and so yeah that policy was put down um, the federal government sort of responded with uh, uh, like three-eyed fish memes and uh, photos of of nuclear power plants in front of the Harbour Bridge and, you know, like really sort of grown-up stuff. Um, <laughs> and and obviously uh, the, uh, the, 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 the wind and solar lobby, which is proudly sponsored by Australian coal. I mean, sorry, did I actually say that? Um, you know, they've been very vocal. And so I, I thought... You know, there was a, I had a lot of inbounds, so I thought I'd put out a, a sort of a thought piece and just put out the facts, really. The very obvious statement in the introduction and conclusion is it really needs to be a bipartisan um, uh, decision to to pursue nuclear power in a country. And we've seen that the success of that in a, in a very short few number of years in the United States and also needs community support. So, um, you know, it, uh, it's the first step, but as I said, it's 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 garnering a lot of a lot of a lot of negativity and and misinformation around at the moment um 
coming back to sort of really basic things like it costs too much and it'll take too long. And the obvious answer to that is too long for what? Because uh, 2040, 2050, they're just dates. Um, we don't hit the finish line and say, yes, we've decarbonized. You've got to continue to decarbonize. Um, and ironically, by the time if, if you assume nuclear comes into Australia in 2040 plus, uh, that's probably around the time that a lot of our wind and solar capacity needs to be rebuilt um, because of the fact it doesn't last that long. So, you know, you, uh, and again, it's it's coming back to me saying it's not wind and solar. Uh, it's not nuclear versus wind and solar and hydro. It's wind and solar and hydro and batteries and nuclear versus coal. Um, yeah, which is, which is a good argument because then it doesn't sound so one-sided. It's kind of like we, we, we kind of need most of all of the above, which, which yeah. is just, I think, obviously, coal. It, and, and even with the coal argument, you, you, you're you talking about, you know, metal coal versus coke and coal. You know, so we, we, it, there's a whole big debate around coal. So it's not all coal is is, is born equal. But and, and you know what? Like, even the, the thermal coal industry in Australia does not get decimated because Australia replaces coal-fired generation. The thermal coal the, the thermal coal uh, the industry in Australia gets decimated because China and India don't want it anymore. Uh, and China in 2040 still have 30% of their grid as coal. Um, so it's not it's not destroying the coal mining industry. Um, you know, it is looking for a sensible replacement for the, the 21 gigawatts of installed coal capacity on the east coast of Australia that right now is keeping my lights on and allowing me to talk to you. Because um, it's not windy outside, right? Yeah, well, absolutely, and, and and there's so many so so many places we can go here. Obviously, you know, I think try, trying to settle on some kind of battery storage technology um, is is going to be critical to to all all of the above. A proper understanding of the coal sector, coal industry, and the different types of coal yeah. and use the use cases. So, really, really important. But let's try and bring it back to nuclear and uranium, okay? Because I think that's yeah. that's the na- nature of the these these calls. So. You've you've hit upon the, and I'm going to probably hit a few topics here. I mean, we just talk through them so we understand the, the moving parts, the variables, as it were. So with the kind of community um, a, a approval, social license, education, etc., it feels to me, reading a lot of um, Aussie press, that the mood has changed, kind of like here in Europe. Politicians feel like they've got permission to talk about nuclear again. Um, you're obviously the the, um, the incumbents are probably still a little bit anti, um, and you know that those looking to get in are making it a, a policy pro nuclear um, a solution. How is is that correct? First of all, are people coming around to the benefits of forgetting price, costs, capex, all of that stuff? Nuclear is an acceptable form of energy for Australia now. Do you think? Yeah, I mean the. A lot of the polling um, and independent polling, it's not just liberal national polling sort of ringing, ringing conservatives, but a lot of the polling is sort of showing that the 15 to 35-year-olds um, are wanting a decarbonised base load electricity and they don't necessarily have the hangover of Chernobyl or or the Cold War or or, or the Simpsons uh, to, to form their bias. So so they're saying, well, why wouldn't we consider it? You know, like, what? there's nothing wrong with it. There's... 30 something countries using it there's 450 reactors that have been operating um you know for 60 odd years so so they're all sort of for it um the the communities where they're proposed to and, and again it was sort of shrewd because the communities where they're proposed they're replacing job losses in coal fired generation where currently the owners of those sites are saying oh we're going to put some wind and solar up and put some batteries in there short duration energy solutions not long duration and you know it's going to employ a hundred people indirect and direct and you say well what's that two security guards and a an electrician to run around and check the poles and wires every now and again um that's, what does that do to the 800 people that lost their job in that in that uh, coal-fired power plant and so you know when you look at the u.s example the department of energy um built on a um, like turbocharged a study that new scale started you know, 70% of jobs in coal-fired generation uh, can be transferred to nuclear. Um, you know, in on average, nuclear power plant workers earn 40% more than their coal counterparts in the United States. So when you start putting, and and Vertical uh, in uh, in Georgia, when it was building, you know, finishing units three and four, you know, they had 9,000 people in construction 
uh, to finish those projects. So when you put it to those communities where they've lost coal generation, um, you know, their, their regional towns, there's nothing going on there necessarily. And you say, hey, there's probably going to be between five to 10,000 people on a construction job here for, let's face it, seven to nine years, maybe longer. Uh, so that granny flat you got out the back of your uh, of your house you can rent out, um, and then a, a vertical employs eight hundred full time people directly involved in that plant. You can have a job where you're earning forty percent more than you were, and this thing's going to be around for sixty years. Oh, and by the way, there's probably going to be a hydrogen electrolyzer turn up because they can use surplus electricity to build fuel cells. There's probably going to be a data center. Craig Scroggy, next DC, is going to build a data center right next door because he needs baseload power. So you're going to get all these tech yuppies running around drinking cafe lattes. Um, you're, going to get, you know, you're going to get heavy machinery and heavy industry back and all of these things. And you know we could probably do a deal to give you all cheap electricity because uh, you supported the project. When you put that to the community, they go, whoa, yeah, you know, thanks, yes, jobs, great, no problems, I can, you know. So, you know, it's it's all about how they then uh, go approach this. But I, but I think for those guys, you know, for those communities which are direct beneficiaries of, you know, re um, replacement of jobs and all of the kind of secondary and by byproduct revenue streams, uh, you know, for, for sure. But for the regular every other household in Australia. We've seen the same thing here in the UK. We're going through a similar process at the moment. You go, where we experience, you talk about in hangover of, you know, Chernobyl, et cetera. We've got the hangover of COVID and raging uh, energy prices across Europe where they went up four, five, six times. That's what people are thinking about here. So for the, every other household in Australia, cheaper energy must be appealing so let's let's talk about some of the kind of cost and metrics so, so i think in your document you talk about the australian um, government having poured in allegedly uh 29 billion aussie of taxpayers money into wind and solar right that, that's a that's a chunk of change and, and and i'm thinking that's that's okay that's a lot of money but likewise to build you know large reactors will will be something comparable but the difference being and i was conscious of this you know, a 60, 80 year life of minor kind of low operating uh, cost. Whereas the renewables, we want all of the above for guys that don't, you know, don't go there. We want them all, but the, the, the wind turbines don't last as long. The solar panels don't last as long. So the, the operating costs on some of those things, not to measure the amount of space. You know, I think you, you give a case study in there where Rio estimates their, their needs from solar would take about 16,000 football fields worth of solar to, to deliver us. That's a big footprint. Um, there's, is there going to be, or is there starting to be a slightly more intelligent conversation around the costs of nuclear versus renewable now? Because I think the energy minister has been a little bit vocal and perhaps a little bit alarmist, again, looking in from outside. Do you feel there's a proper conversation going to be happening? Oh, look, I mean, I think they're, they, they, they're putting a lot of pressure on the coalition to to put the nuclear costings out. But, you know, on the flip side, the, the government is not really, they're starting to put numbers now, but they haven't really, they're not talking about the, the cost of renewal and transmission. And, and there's all of this report, you know, the CSIRO gen cost report and, and what have you. And, and, you know, you can, you can spend hours and hours and hours pulling that to pieces and finding the flaws in that, but there's a whole bunch of assumptions made that are just when you design a report you make assumptions and then you start your study uh so you know the, the assumptions l may not have felt flawed at the time but they're looking flawed now like uh you know that a, a nuclear power plant in that would be 30 years uh and running at 50 percent capacity factor when we know they're 60 years and can do up to 92 percent capacity factor in the united states for example um and that everything that's already been invested in 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 the rest of the grid cost is is a sunk cost. So, if you build new solar, and and the Australian Renewable Energy Association estimates that a gigawatt of solar is is about a billion and a half Aussie dollars to build that, right? Um, but they're sort of saying, well, the the twelve billion we've sunk into Snowy to and counting, we've sunk into Snowy two point zero. That's now a sunk cost for firming because it's already been spent. And you say, well, okay, but if you're comparing 
a new nuclear plant or a new coal plant or a new gas plant where you've got the electricity when you want it. It's dispatchable without weather and without the ability, you know, without having to fill up the storage. Um, surely you've got to compare what it, everything costs on on that side. And 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 I think you know that that's where there's a, a huge amount of misinformation. As I said, you go into rabbit holes, and um, so eventually there has to be an a, a, an adult discussion. I think. Part of it is it, it can get so complex when you're talking about grids that, you know, like I, my my eyes glaze over it and I've spent a lot a lot of time trying to understand it. You're trying to sell that to the average Australians. <laughs> you know, it's, you can sell it any way you want uh, and come out with a different response from the same set of data. So it, it, it's it's a complex topic that, that uh, that you know, they're not quite, they're nowhere near yeah. having an adult conversation on yet. It, like, like with all, like with all numbers, people are going to take this, the the side and interpret it the way that yeah. they want to argue for or against, uh, for, for for sure. But why I'm just having this conversation here is because this is a nice kind of case study for every other conversation that's happening all around the world, UK, Europe, US, you, you name it. We've been, it's going to be going through the same thing. There's a lot of uh, kind of, uh, I suspect, a lot of uh, NIMBY. Uh, component, not my backyard component to to these sorts of conversations, um, irrespective of job creation, or as, irrespective of the you know kind of the carpet conversation. It's going to be no one kind of wants this ISO. But what they what they might what might help um, some people sort of stomach it is is you know it's not a new idea, but putting some of these SMRs or building some of these reactors in existing um, coal powered fire stations where. The look and feel doesn't feel, you know, it doesn't doesn't look too different. But you've kind of got the benefits of this huge infrastructure build out already. Make some may save some costs. So, in Australia, how many, how many have been suggested or recommended? And like, I guess they're presumably all on the east coast, are they? Yeah, so it's, it's five sites on the east coast, and 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 two in on on the rest of it. One in South Australia, one in Western Australia. Okay, um, you know, and the, I mean, the beauty about the five sites is that. You can start with one reactor and put a gigawatt or, or you know, or, or AP1400 um, Korean design to start, and then you can add another one or a third one, um, you know. So they are, you know, big previously reducing coal sites that are already connected to the grid. You know, I did have it put to me that, uh, oh, well, you know, one, SMRs are, are not proven technology, not, they're, not, they're not commercially built yet, and two, nobody's built a... a a nuclear power plant on an old coal site. Uh, and my response to that is it, it wasn't that long ago um, that, uh, you know, nobody thought we'd be able to mass produce uh, electric vehicles uh, for a price cheaper than a, a, a conventional vehicle. It wasn't that long ago that the thought of building a gigawatt solar was just like, you know, forget about it. And it wasn't, and, and we still haven't solved, show me a country in the world that has solved a long duration energy storage system that's commercially scalable on a gigawatt scale uh, anywhere in the world. We haven't solved that. And there's this assumption that that will come. The technologies and the chemistries are just being worked out. That will come. And I go, well, okay, sure. So if you think that will come when it's nowhere in the world, why can't a nuclear reactor be built on a coal plant? Why can't a small modular reactor be built successfully and connected to the grid? Um, you can't say human beings are going to innovate this, but not that. Uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think um, there's there's always going to be arguments for and against. Uh, don't don't worry about it. with with in anything new. Look, and it's fairly look, nuclear's been around for a long time, but in in many ways, it's also a fairly nascent industry in in you know in the time we we live now. Um, yeah, you know, so, it's, I think somebody said if if. Uh, if uh, if nuclear power was invented ten years ago when we were trying to decarbonize the world, the world would be falling all over themselves to build it because uh, you know <laughs> there's no history on it. Um, yeah. But look, look, yeah. The reality is the Australian policy is not going to make me or my investors any more money. It does zero for my supply demand. It does. However, there's a heap of eyeballs in the country on it now, um, and and it's just getting to the point where people are saying, okay, right, so whether it happens in Australia or not, what is like, why is this bloke guy Keller running around with and, and giving an opinion on it? How's he making money out of this? <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the full circle where people say, well, where can I invest? Um, and, and I guess 
the from an Australian uranium perspective, if this discussion causes, say, Western Australia and, and South Australia to rethink their their bans on uranium mining, uh, then yeah, there's a heap of opportunity I can use to uh, to make some money there. Uh, you know, if uh, if the Northern Territory government decides to you know, uh, step in and be a lot more proactive. There's a heap of money I can make there as well. So, um, you know, uh, my my opinions are sort of coming from the fact that I'm Australian. I've got kids, uh, hoping I'm eventually going to be having grandkids one day, and I'd like to be able to sit here at night and turn the light on, um, and and then have clean baseload electricity. And and if you wanted to put one around the corner from me, I'd happily have one here. Um, I don't have any problem with it. Right. And obviously, I think I think you've alluded that the technology is going to be uh, Korean or possibly Westinghouse, but definitely not yeah. Chinese or Russian design. Nah. Nah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you know, we've already had an experience uh, with the French in our submarines, so uh, yeah. it's not going to be a French reactor design as well. I, I don't think no, they'll be rushing no. to, uh, to come to our aid. <laughs> Right. Okay. So, like, I'd like to say, I think this has also been a useful conversation because this this conversation will be replicated ra- around the world, and the, sorry, some of the issues around this conversation will be replicated around the world. Um, now, as you just um, alluded to, um, the you know maybe the Aussies aren't going to make a big impact globally, but uh, in, in terms of uh, the the demand side of things, supply side of things. Uh, obviously, a lot of Aussie companies, some of them have been in the news recently. Uh, where do you want to start? Paladin? <laughs> Picking up fishing. Was that... I certainly didn't see that coming, did you? Uh, I, I knew they'd been sniffing around in the Athabasca Basin, or I knew they'd been sniffing around um, in a lot of different places uh, because, you know, when somebody turns up that you're not expecting to see, that people talk. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it surprised me, but it didn't surprise me. Um, you know, when you're a company the size of Paladin, you know, running around trying to pick up some exploration ground or trying to get another questionable jurisdiction, it doesn't really move the needle for you. Um, so, you, you know, they're trying to get something in the east side of the basin is going to be hard because it's fairly well controlled and Chemico, Arado, Denison, they've all sort of got, you know, their, uh, so, you know, when the fact that whether fishing was up for sale or not, some would argue that they were open for discussions. Um, you know, it, it gives them something to talk about. It gives them something to point towards because uh, I think they're finally sort of understanding that Michelin's maybe a, yeah, I mean, now I think on their presentation, it's 2036 or 2035. I mean, even that's maybe a bit generous. Um, but, you know, look, the market wanted them to use their paper because they thought they were too expensive, and they have. Uh, and if they get it right or when they get it right, they'll have a, a second asset producing in the Athabasca Basin with, with the 10-year mine life, um, you know, 9 million pounds a year or whatever, whatever it's going to be. So I think most of the market is probably going to, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see the the fish and shareholders' response. I think, um, you know, we're already seeing sort of things. People running around saying, "Oh, somebody else is going to come in over the top." But I don't. I mean, Next Gen's not going to. Why would they? Um, you know, they they think they've got another arrow in PCE. So, uh, and the, you know, I was out there two weeks ago. They got four rigs drilling like mad out there, and uh, they're moving core like it's going out of fashion. Um, so they're not going to do anything. Uh, they can just sit back and watch. And what a major's going to come in. I doubt it. Um, yeah, there's there's too many things that still need to happen on that project uh, for anybody to, to say this is a slam dunk. So um, you know, Paladin will, as I said, they'll they'll, they'll progress it. Um, the market will 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 eventually work out a value for it. And and as I said, I think the fish and shareholders will probably say, well, we've got a bigger, smaller piece of a bigger pie now that's got cash flow. <laughs> um, yeah, so. We either, you know, it's, again, you get out or you, or you deal with it and, and, and add it to your portfolio. Well, I, th- I think it's interesting to me because I think Paladin, um, it's, it's clear, will need maybe another one of these, maybe another two of these, right? Let's say expensive paper, all paper deal. Um, they needed to do something um, with, with, with that. I think some people in the, like, in the market would argue that Paladin's probably well valued, as in overvalued potentially. So they're going to need to do something different. But they're going to need to do something with companies of a certain size. There's a lot of 
exploration place, but I think no one was going to dabble in that. Um, if you're going for it, it's going to be a developer, advanced developer, ideally. Um, and changing jurisdictional risk as well is quite nice. Yeah, and as you say, I mean, these, these CapEx requirements aren't small, right? I mean, you know, like that'll be a billion and a half dollars by the time they come to build it, probably more. Uh, and so you need a company with a market cap of cat of of, okay. of Paladin or uh, or more to be able to 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 push that sort of project through. I mean, you know, the reality is, um, you know, there's no on that side of the basin. Next gen's first in line for project finance debt there, right? So and, and that'll all come from Canadian banks. So if you're fishing and you're sitting there going, well, hang on, I'm maybe a year or two or three behind. And and these banks are still full of next gen debt because they want to be, not because they're stuck in it, because they want to be. Are they going to have the capacity to go and lend another billion and a half into a uranium project on the same side of the basin? I mean, you know, that's that that's what it comes comes down to is 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 that capex requirement. Uh, you know, whereas your company like Paladin, you're trying to do that. You've got Aussie money, you've got Canadian money. Uh, you've got cash flow. You've got a whole bunch of things that project finance banks can get some comfort in, uh, and you're a proven producer, uh, as opposed to to Ross and the team saying, "Hey, can I have some money, please?" And they go, "Well, what have you built?" <laughs> so, you know, that, we need to see more of that if 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 we're going to get some of these advanced development projects into into, especially with big capex bills into play. I think you make a good point because I think a lot of if the money's going to come from Canada, um, these are not big banks. In reality, they're not big banks that, you know, maybe, um, and, and certainly in terms of the allocation to, to money has historically been been, been good. Uh, it's come off a lot. Um, and so there's only so many players. And if you're at the front of the queue or, or near term, first mover advantage, definitely going to come into play here. For for Paladin, obviously, I think, uh, was it Fidelity kind of bounced into them? Yeah. A few months yep. ago, you know, took a, took a big chunk. Getting these generalists in with, you know, who can deploy and allocate. A lot of a lot of kind of capital into uh, companies is is good. It also yeah. suggests getting access to some of those kind of global generalist uh, investor uh, capital as well. So I think for Paladin, it feels like a really good deal. I guess my questions would be around uh, vision. If one, they did, they knew that perhaps they may not be in the right position in the taxi rank. Um, would they be able to get this thing um, financed themselves? And have they, quite frankly, got the stomach for another three years of of this? It's been a long, long road. Um, so may, maybe, maybe it makes sense for them in, in terms of energy levels. But thirty yeah. percent premium, man, without competition, without competitive tension, it's hard to you know drive up the the the, the value or the premium that you you, you might achieve. Do you, yeah. do you think that's a kind of fair reflection of where they're at? Um, do you think that 30 percent is what good or what they could get, or you know, how do you value that? Yeah, I mean, it, look, it comes down to who else is in the mix, and and I don't see anybody else in the mix. Um, and you're you not know, you're not just talking like the Karmicos, you're talking about the BHPs of this world yeah, as well. Yeah, right? I mean, why why would why why would a non uranium mate or even a, a major like BHP who knows uranium why would you wade into a development project where you've still got, you know, provincial and federal risk? You you've still got, you know, construction permits and and you know and and as you know, it's the Athabasca Basin. And, and as I said, we we're flying over this area and I looked down. I said I didn't realise there'd been fires here. And I oh know that was 2019. Like it's it's not it's 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 it's, it's vast. It's immense. It's crappy little pine trees and lots and lots of water but you know it's not an environment that's a fragile sort of system there so you then got to have you haven't got tailings you know approved all of that stuff a major is going to sit there and say i'm going to let that advanced development company do all the hard work and then if i wait in over the top on a 40 or a 50 percent premium at least i know my only risk is is backing myself to build the thing um I just yeah, I so I think it comes down to who are the suitors and there's not a very long list at all. I mean Cameco is not gonna do it. Arano's uh, you know, trying to do things with what they've got in the Athabasca and they, they probably they're looking around and you know, they're obviously losing supply in Niger and things like that. Um uh so but are they ready to write a check? No. Um you know, Denison's got their own stuff going on, they're all busily trying to so everyone who's got a who's 
maybe got the ability to consolidate on a development project has already got their own things to do and the rest are all explorers or, or project incubators. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's tough. Like I say, competitive tension is, is critical. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm not quite sure why companies kind of start a process that they don't think they're going to get that because, you know, playing people off against each other is, is you know, can drive things forward. Otherwise, I see it, you end up with some not that enthusiastic premium to after for all your hard work in what is a kind of depressed market. Okay. And let's face it, you know, it, we, we, your aim had a bit of a knock recently after kind of strong start to the, to the year. I mean, what, what do you attribute that to? Oh, well, where do you start? I mean, it's, uh, you know, we had some, we, we had a bit of cyclicality into, re, into resources more broadly and commodity prices. Obviously we had this squeeze on Comex copper that got everyone excited about data centers. We're trying to, buy copper and things like that when it was just a good old fashioned, uh, you know, going up the short out. Um, and that got people excited, you know, China looked like they were sort of, uh, they were, they were playing a little bit of late seasonality there. So, you know, I think people sort of came piling in thinking that, yes, here we go. Resources is back on. Um, and, and then of course you, you, we got through May, which was, you know, sort of, sort of white knuckling, you know, selling May go away. It sort of came out all right, probably largely because NVIDIA was dragging everything up. But, you know, I think then we come into June and, and we've just had that sort of whammy of the Canadian capital gains changes, you know, where, you know, that discount went from 50% to 33% yesterday, I think. Um, and what have people made money on in resources in Canada? Uranium. Um, and so, you know, that came in. Aussie fiscal year, as I said earlier, it's been hurting me, but, you know, there's been, again, People are making money, capital gains versus capital losses, play all that sort of game. Uh, domestic funds all sit there and sit on their hands the last two weeks of June because they don't want to be seen in the market ahead of the fiscal year. And uh, and then, you know, I think fuel buyers came out of, of Atlanta, uh, uh, you know, trying to give the message that, hey, we're not in a hurry to move in the summer because we're still trying to work out what these waivers look like. So don't expect us to be in buying material. And I think anybody holding uranium went, oh, bang. <laughs> and so we had an $83 print um, or $82 print or whatever it was. And so, yeah, I think all of that sort of combined with just a, a lack of buyers and, and you know, yeah, we have a brutal little pullback. But uh, I actually saw a chart on, on X of the last cycle and saying, you know, it's not for the faint hearted. It was showing all of the, the pullbacks on the way up. You know, and it's like 40%, 17 days, you know, 35% over 22 days. And I was like, mm, okay. Um, you know, as as we said, we've seen these before. Um, it's just from my perspective, when it's your last last month of the year, it's, it's never nice. And, and, and I've got no no doubt whatsoever that, that mid-July, August, it'll be, you know, back up where it started again. Uh, because nothing's changed in the market. It is still a tight market and utilities still need to yellow cake and they're not doing anything to incentivize anybody to bring any to any supplier uh, uh, in, in any time soon. So, um, you know. Well, I, th I think there's a presumption that the demand story ha is, is continues, definitely continues to build. So no, no, we don't need to kind of go over old ground there. What, yeah. what I, I am seeing changing is a realization that the supply side is looking very, very different. We're seeing the triumvirate of uh, China, Russia, Kazakhstan, and pounds moving east, enrichment moving east. Um, you're seeing uh, a kind of reality, a dawning reality that some of the timelines as indicated by some of the bigger players in, 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 the, in the junior uranium space the timers are getting drawn out, and I think I think that could be really, really interesting when utilities start to maybe uh, reassess some of the indications by the companies on, as to which year they're going to get into production or aim to get into production. Uh, it's a little bit harder than we think, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you trying to oh, be discreet and subtle? <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> Every time I see a broken model and supply and demand, and uh, and if there's a breakdown in it, uh, in in fact, uh, I've got one here in front of me because we were talking earlier, and, and the, some of the things we're talking about aren't even in here. And I was thinking, you know, everything's too optimistic, and and there's no 
urgency. Uh, I mean, you know, it's these developers have been sitting on these things for years, waiting for this to happen, and now it's happened, and they're no closer to production than they were four, four years ago, and when they were waiting for price, um, because everything takes time, and it's and you know, if you had price uh, continuing higher. And if you had utilities screaming at their respective governments saying, Oi, I need to get some uranium and your red tape and bureaucracy is not helping, uh, you know, then it's a very different story. Um, um, you know, if you had utilities acting like OEMs and, you know, the battery makers in the lithium space and saying, Here's a check, build the mine, I need the uranium. But that's not happening. Utilities are saying, Hey, I just had a meeting with this guy who's got 47 projects. <laughs> and he says, but by 2032, 33 of them have been in production. What an excellent bloke. <laughs> and you go, Whoa, wait, okay. I spoke to the same bloke and I would be lucky if one of them's in production. <laughs> well, it's what we call pub talk, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> and and, 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 and un unfortunately, but it's kind of rife. You've got the brokers buying it. You've got the bankers buying it. You've got the utilities buying it, but the guys in the industry who've been there and done it before are going, no, 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 no. You know, it's it's hard. You've got to have people with the right skill sets um, yep. to actually put these things, to build these things so that they work, so that they're economic. Heaven forbid, economic. Do you remember economic? Who yeah. used to care about that? And um, they kind of got all this geopolitics going on about, well, you have it's the east-west pounds. Where's, where are these pounds going? Who's going to enrich it any time soon? As you say, you know, in, when the utilities get a little bit more comfortable with the, the waiver situation, I mean, I heard a conversation out of DC which suggests that actually the politicians are going, look, for a fact only, you're good till 2030 because we need, we need this stuff working in country. So uh, I think people may be getting a little bit more relaxed with with that understanding of, of um, whether being a kind of punitive uh, action further down the line or not, uh, we shall see. And um, and then you kind of got the financing in junior mining, which is, as we've discussed discussed earlier, is, is a bit of a train wreck at the moment. Um, why invest in this space when it usually ends up in sort of crushing defeat? I mean, we we were talking before we started the show about the Vol um, Victoria Gold situation with their heat bleach. Um, we saw the situation last year in in, in Turkey, similar. We've seen Valet before. It doesn't take much to go wrong to change your fortunes. So as a bank, as a as a, as a, as a risk assessment uh, officer uh, or compliance officer, you're going to go, guys, you need to be really sure on this one because we've, we've got the added factor here of radioactive material, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's when you look at, governments like they're pushing downstream on everything right the u.s government let's focus on the the fuel cycle let the market do with the uranium because the fuel cycle is easy to deal with because it's quasi-government anyway uh it doesn't involve digging a hole and it doesn't involve a tailings pit and 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 everything else um but yeah you're right and and it's because i think and you, i mean you see it everywhere west australian governments uh, pushing downstream with, uh, with you know monazite processing in Luca and they're you know handing money over hand over fist for things like that uh, and saying well you know the mining just you, you deal with it um, and and so investors are sitting there saying as you, as you said you know like how do I uh, do I want to be like maybe I'll maybe I'll fund one of these projects but do I want to be like, there's no there's no Big pools of capital that you know there's that you've seen in past commodity cycles in in your silvers and your golds and your coppers you know your Rick rules your Pielasson like you, you're not seeing any big groups like that coming in and saying we'll fund the uranium sector um, everyone's saying we'll own some equity <laughs> um, maybe we can you know do some little deals here and there but a prepay and get some you know uh, royalties or something but oh, uh, I don't want to take construction risk on uh, on uranium. No, but but even those guys aren't big, right? They, they they sound big to us. You know, they're kind of they've been some of the most successful names in the space because it's been free and unfettered by competition from say U.S. banks. It would literally show everyone up on that list up because they're some of the best bankers in the world. But yeah, the U.S. it's too small a space. It's too small 
an opportunity. Uh, there are better uh, ways to allocate their capital. And yeah. So, yeah. So the guys in the know, the specialists are saying, we, because we're in the know, because we're specialists, we know that this could be a train wreck. And we're not exposing ourselves to that risk. Um, it's like, but where, where, where is it going to come from? What, what needs um, to happen? You know, like you say, OEMs, car manufacturers um, have been quite good in terms of moving upstream a little bit on some of the lithium projects, some of yeah. the nickel projects, etc. Um, will this, will this happen? Any side of saying it kind of feels like it's got to to give confidence to the generalists. Yeah, to see I, that actually think, industry's coming in. That's going to be good, right? Yeah, and the problem has been as well is that the the we 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 haven't even we haven't even given the finance the you know the the the, the project finance sort of market any training wheels. We haven't given them the chance to 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 finance some of these smaller projects that are that are restarting because it's all been done with equity. So you know, boss. You know, even Peninsula, I'm going to go and raise debt. He just used equity again. You know, Paladin was all equity. So, like, we haven't given those guys, the bankers, a chance to say, hey, why don't you write a $100 million check um, instead of a billion-dollar check and see how it goes for you? Um, you know, get your credit risk, get your risk committees, get everybody comfortable with the fact that you've you financed a, a million or two million pound a year uranium project. And, and so the sector hasn't given them that opportunity uh, because, but... We're going to get to the point where equity is not going to finance next gen or Fission or Denison or, uh, you know, because they're billion dollar plus things. You can't, you're not going to be able to raise that. Um, and then we're going to turn around to that sector and say, hey, okay, so you, we've, you've missed all the small stuff that's now in production, there's cash flow, and you, you know, but here, just write me a billion dollar check now. You know, that's where I think the sector's missed a trick a little bit. And because it's because the sector is so small, there's been institutions that say, oh, yeah, you know what? Um, you want to go and raise 300 million bucks, I'll give you 50 million bucks because I want exposure and I'm a big fund and I can't buy that in the screen. Um, so let me in. And of course, when it goes wrong, they're like, ah, how do I get out? <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's kind of interesting, though. If you look at, like, I think one of, the, one of my favorite deals I ever did, which was um, in, um, is in Viet Vietnam, right? At, Cambodia, right? Conflating. Uh, it, was, it was in Cambodia, right? It was, it was a hydro deal, right? Yeah. And this deal was quite good. You had a, I'm not going to name names, but it's, 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 a, it's a, a Cambodian billionaire brought up in Australia, actually. And he basically said, right, I'm going to spend uh, a bit of money kind of putting together the, the basic premise of this, of this plan. He spent, I think, four million bucks of that money, went to the Cambodian government and said, hey, you underwrite this, backstop this, and then give me a contract. And it was for a long time. I mean, crikey, it was long. It was like a 40-year term. Was, I guess that's the Asian factor. Yeah. And we go, um, I can now go and raise money off the back of that. So um, I'm, I'm not saying I just need you to kind of backstop it, whether yeah. they were or not is another matter. But I can go to the banks and say, look, here's a 40-year contract. Um, it's worth X. Um, give me the money to build this out. Anyway, obviously, he actually ended up doing it with a sort of Chinese group because they get cheap, cheap um, you know, two percent type level of um, funding, and that was fantastic. Do you think government is going to need to kind of step up here because of the, the or at least underwrite backstop uh, projects like this if they want it and they're pro it? Surely, surely for them, it's kind of drop in the ocean just to kind of get things going and show a kind of route to market and show a kind of success level for, you know, advanced development stories that are, you know, at FID stage and say, right, this is how this financing happens. I'm trying to work out how, how it works because so many CEOs come on here and go, hey, this whole goddamn system is broken. The finance system is broken. I'm like, well, maybe it just needs to come out in a different way. I mean, look, you're seeing it in grants and loans with critical minerals. You know, is, are they effective? Uh, you know, those that get it say yes. Those that don't get it say no, but it's only a rort if you're not involved. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, but potentially governments are showing that they're prepared to do that. But, of course, because uranium is an energy metal, it's not a critical mineral. So uh, it sort of falls off that list. If price responds and we're sitting at two hundred dollars and and there's utilities falling all over themselves to to guarantee a, a big floor price, uh, then you probably don't need governments to backstop deals because you know utilities all they need to do is just you know here's the floor, 
uh, and people will write debt as they get more comfortable. But if the price stays here, the market's not going to give that motivation or that comfort where there's such a big margin. So you you know you you, you probably have to. But as I said, you know, it's like governments around the world are giving loans and grants out for critical minerals. So it, it's something they could look at. But I think it it really comes down to um, you know utilities actually stopping and thinking for a moment and saying, you know, I've been buying uranium from the Kazakhs and I've been buying uranium from Cameco for all of these years and I've been getting bits and pieces here in the BHP or whatever. Um, you know, I'm going to need to think about the fact that even going from 20 to to $100 there's no last cycle we had, you know, Macala, Cigar Lake, you know, all of these things turning up. Utilities are going, wow, this is fantastic. Oh, that's much. We're not seeing that. So, you know, they, they've got a blink. And I think they probably will. Um, I think in, in many ways, this Russian import ban has been detrimental to the, the, the attention that was on uranium because they sort of been self-sanctioning anyway. They were, you know, trying to work out whether they give Urenko money to go and expand, you know, um, uh, enrichment, whether uh, whether uh, Chemico and Westinghouse were going to turn on uh, Springfield or whatever it is in, in the UK and conversion. And they were getting to the point where they're like, okay, we've got some comfort. We know where we need to be. Uh, now we should probably look at the uranium because the converters are saying, you don't have the uranium. We don't convert. We're not swapping anymore. You need to deliver it. Okay, we'll look at that. Oh, hang on, Russian import ban. Crap. I wasn't thinking necessarily about 24 to 27. Um, I was thinking 27 onwards, and now I've got to think about the next three years, and that's a bit more near real term. Um, so, you know, like that plays out. They probably get to WNA in September. They go, how clever are we? Uh, we've got our waivers. Uh, and the converters say, but you still haven't delivered the, uh, the, uh, the yellow cake that you, uh, you want to uh, put through the converter. So where's that? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, right. We need to think about that. So, you know, it comes around, but it's just not at the pace that the crypto style <laughs> equity investors want. <laughs> not, a, not an instant rush. It, it, it's, it's not an instant rush, but I said, one of the, one of the kind of things um, around this kind of like holding pattern that we're in at the moment, they're, they're one of the things I actually quite like about it, it's kind of made the market just pause and think about this massive influx, deluge of new shit coat, pardon my French, pub coats, <laughs> which, which, which we would expect to see where people are picking up NL piece of crap, uranium asset from, I don't know, 1970, 1980, and raising money for it. And I, and I think this kind of pulls me to people, hang on, how delicate is the space we, which we operate? Do we need any more exploration stories, quite frankly, right now? until some of these companies, these developers, actually show they're going to be able to raise the capital to get into production and deliver into the market. That's what I like. I don't know about you. What, what, what's your view? So, yeah, I mean, I spent a week up in, in Saskatchewan a couple of weeks ago and and hung out in Saskatoon with a whole bunch of uh, uranium locals up there. And, 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 you know, the one thing that's, really really clear is just the the dna that these guys and girls possess in the about the athabasca basin you know like they all know they all know everything about each other's exploration projects they all know where they want to be they know what they want to see when it comes up or if it comes up and they know which drillers are good which contractors are good uh you know if there's an exploration geo running around that they might be able to find you know when they should put their stuff into the assay lab. And you're seeing all of these small companies now sort of spinning out Athabasca projects and they're sitting in Perth or, or the UK or, or, or wherever. And they're raising five or 6 million bucks and listing and they're getting one drill campaign, uh, but they haven't spent their money very well. Uh, and they're earning in to these locals who are all project incubating. For them. And, and these guys are sitting there going, this is gravy because we're never going to develop that project. We've been given some money and some shares. If they find something uh, and they promote their stock well enough, we'll get the upside because we've got equity in it and we'll go and concentrate on our own thing. And that's sort of my, I was chatting to someone the other day and I said, look, you know, as investors, 
how do we, and, and again, there's a small number of good teams around, right? They're not growing on trees. Now there's a heap of projects because we know that from last cycle. Um, how do we as investors convince some of these people to roll into a proper market cap company, uh, go and list or spec it or 50 million or a hundred million or something, get a whole bunch of good projects, get, you know, raise some enough money, have enough backing to be able to do more than one drill program. Because to your point, there is just no money flying into these explorers from the equity market who are desperate for a, a 10 bag or a hundred bag because we haven't seen a 10 bag or a hundred bag. And you know, the, the people that have found things haven't done anything with them necessarily. And every time we think that there's a, uh, this is a great project, another three come to market because somebody else has, has spun them out. And, and we you know we're not in that market where, where, where there's investor money desperate to be in, in exploration. So uh, you need to really, really pick carefully who, who it is you're dealing with and what they're doing um, because it's so no, easy I, to blow money out there. It's so easy to blow money out there. And, and we need a few test cases where people are doing it properly. Because mm -hmm. we've seen a few companies you know, in the basket base and have converted into prospect generators because they couldn't make a discovery themselves, partly because of you know, cash constraint or probably because they just couldn't make a discovery. Um, but there are some quite nice groups that, you know, that I, I look at, like you know, the ISO Energy. I mean, that kind of roll-up process. They picked up, um, obviously, Aussie company, 92 Energy, um, I think Latitude, uh, which is kind of spun out of, God, was it Valor or something like that? In, in another Canadian. You know, I can see them starting to do some interesting things. Arthur, likewise, they're sitting on a big land bank, so they probably will spin out or JV and try and get some dollars into the ground. I think they've got about 30 million bucks worth of, of other people's money exploring their, 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 some of their land bank, which is really, really interesting. Premier America, another interesting one. So I think there are some good teams. And by good teams, I mean not just sitting on good assets, but access to the capital markets or deal structuring so that they can advance projects. The ones that make me nervous are the ones who just sit there year after year after year and just they're the same market cap or, or less they're you know the share price hasn't moved they've run out of ideas and you think well why do i bother why would i why do i want more of that coming into the marketplace so that's what i mean i said i'm secretly kind of super pleased that this this kind of reset moment um is gonna stop some of that yeah inevitable crap coming into the market yeah i agree i i agree and i mean it's it's, it's actually you talked about iso we we went out there and spent uh spent some time on site out there and you know you're standing on that hurricane high grade zone and you know kamikarana literally just over there what <laughs> and you know you, they tell you dimensions that this all body is this big and you stand there and you flow on a float plane for miles to land on a lake in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, and you stand there and you go, oh, my God, this ore body is literally 100 metres by 75 metres, you know, 250 metres below the ground. And I mean, yes, it extends on the other side. But just the small footprint of these of these ore bodies in the Athabasca, you know, we we're standing at next gen at the, at the Discovery Hole. Had it been five metres to the left, they would have missed that ore body. Uh, they just scraped it with that first hole and you sit there and you go like anybody that's turning around saying to you, oh, I'm going to go and throw a few drill holes in there. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I want to see all of your, all of your surveys, you know, uh, you know, is this A&T working? Have you run that? I want to make sure that you have got a really good degree of certainty before you're spending five or 600 Canadian dollars per meter to go down six or 700 meters, potentially missing something by one meter. I mean, it's that to me was like this huge, big expanse, and these ore bodies are, you know, like they say, needle in a haystack. <laughs> it's it's a needle in a bloody hay mountain, <laughs> trying to find these. It's, things. No, it's 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 really hard, and that's why you know I think there's quite a few geologists that we meet who've gone through their entire career never having made a discovery. Uh -huh. Seems seems a weird thing to say, right? Because that's what you guys do, you know. And so I think I think there was a sort of slight uh, fashion during COVID of describing certain drill holes, one drill hole, as having made a discovery. I'm like, 
you are kidding me. <laughs> yeah. Changing the terminology and the, and the interpretation does not make that a discovery, right? <laughs> so it's hard. It's hard for, yeah. for, for sure. Hey, let's, let's, let's bring, the, bring this back because we're sort of bouncing around a few topics here at the moment. And we, we've kind of gone global. We've hit the Athabasca okay. um, base in Africa. Uh, Africa. And this really does get a little bit geopolitical. Obviously, Niger, the mm-hmm. key. You and I have talked about coups before in Africa. They happen all the time. It's just a change of government, but usually it's business as usual. The Niger government's gone, hold my beer. I think we're going to change things up here. French out, USA out. Um, what's it looking like there for you? Oh, look, I mean, you know, like there was a lot of hoo-ha around sort of Rano losing the MRR and mining license and, and, and some pressure on GovX to, with Matawala there. Um, you know, when you dig into the, 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 the depths of that, there was a mining issue, a mining license issued, I think 2016, uh, that had a requirement to do something within two years. So, you know, they were sitting on an expired mining license, whether they liked it or not. Um, and you know, the feedback I'm sort of getting is like, yes, the Chinese are crawling all over, uh, Niger, uh, I don't think the Russians... I mean, there's lots of talk that they are looking for mining projects, but I've not necessarily heard that. Um, it's sort of, I'd love to see the Benin border open up. I think that would probably be a positive sign. Um, and that is just the Junta or, or the government, whatever you want to call them there. Uh, that's them, you know, uh, having a protest because Benin supported Ecoware. So it's, it's, it's Niger that's closed the border, not the other way around. Um, you know, although I'm hearing there's a lot of pressure from local businessmen and women to open that border because a lot comes through that port. Um, you know, so I'd like to see that. Um, you know, it's, they haven't indicated that they're going to nationalize anything. Uh, obviously, remember with, with DASA, they have a 20% stake in that project. Um, and it's the most advanced project uh, of all of the, I mean, they've got some oil and gas that's been built by the Chinese, but so it's not a, it's not a development project that's now pumping gas, pumping oil. So it's the most near term source of revenue. Um, do you really want to go and disrupt that and, and risk? I mean, there's still the American ambassador still there, you know, do you really want to risk putting all your eggs in a Russia, China basket? You know, it seems that they're wanting to, to say, okay, you're all here. Let's. Let's, you know, you can battle it out yourselves as to who gets what. Um, but there's risk, you know. It's 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 not like other uh, political disruptions um, that, that 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 country's had. You know, the, the French are still producing. the The only reason that they're they're going slow is because they can't export uh, the yellow cake, so they've got some sitting on site because they go through um, through down to Benin through the port down there, and they're not prepared to 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 make other uh, other arrangements. Uh, obviously, their troops have gone. Um, the French nationals. There's a big thing about them leaving. But again, the reality was, 96 percent of that workforce uh, and the, on on the Samir there are, are locals anyway. Um, there wasn't any, you know. There's a handful of French nationals and senior management, but 96 percent are locals. And you know, it appears the government sort of saying to them, "Hey, are you going to get back to to your your old run rate?" And they're saying, "Sure, but we need to." You need to open the border. So, as I said, I think border opens, French kick back up again. Uh, Global can get things back in a bit more easily. <clears throat> um, you know, maybe there's a tender out for MRR, which, let's face it, is is large, low grade. Uh, you know, expensive. Um, you know, so uh, there was no way at Rado was going to be developing in at ninety or a hundred bucks. Um, do the Russians or Chinese pay for it and develop it because they just want the pounds? Maybe. Um, does that mean they're going to nationalise anything else there? I, I I don't think so. But but again, I, I I'm not an, an African African geopolitical specialist, <laughs> so um, or an African. <laughs> but you know, as I said, I mean that that yeah, yeah. that look that Dasa ore body is a fantastic ore body, and um, you know, it should be mined. It's it's unfair for it not to be mined. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it it interesting times there. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously with their kind of China Russia influence um, as well in in country well across Africa more 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 broadly. Yeah, look, I mean, the reality is they're know, everywhere. Um, you know, and uh, and the French uh, are less places than they were. The Germans are less places than they were. The the US are, 
are kind of there, but not really, but depending on the on which government it is. Uh, the US have been distracted in other parts of the world, obviously. Um, so, you know, the Russians and Chinese are in every, they're in Namibia as well, um, you know, but no one's talking yeah, about it. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. what, what are they, 20? What, is it, how much sort of paladins are they? Yeah, 25% 25? or something, yeah. Yeah, 25, yeah, yeah, something like that, isn't it, right? We we kind of forget that <laughs> um, element there. And it's kind of like not like Canada. I don't think there's any rules or regulations around how much they can own of, no. of any one no. asset country in, in Africa. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. And and I think from my experience of working in Africa for all those years and sort of seeing you know, the, the, the Chinese companies coming in and out of country, yeah, you know, like I say, fifty you percent know, of the planes that I was on was with were, were Chinese Chinese nationals yeah. doing deals, but they're, they're they're moving quicker, moving faster, and I think I, st- I think that's still the case. There's a lot of like I think good good rhetoric coming out of the US and and funding for downstream stuff in in the US and people are taking advantage of of various uh, you know IRA type funding, but the reality is when it comes to securing these pounds, I'm not seeing a whole bunch of action in Africa. I'm not actually seeing a lot of anything going upstream for some of these, you know, wannabe U- U.S. producers with their half, you know, half million pound a year target or whatever it is that they're looking for. Um, and I'm not surprised because there's the kind of no, no kind of scale uh, of, of opportunity there. It's kind of you know bit part. So me, so maybe do you think? Obviously, we, we talked about you know Paladin doing a little bit of a. a, a, a M and A activity, maybe even starting a roll up exercise, and you know, Boss did the same. You know, did a, did a deal with um, uh, Encore. You know, you know uh, when was that? A couple of months ago now. It's a bit, a bit longer. Um, do you think that's what it's going to take to be get noticed, scale? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think just on Africa, I think it would be a, a strategic misstep for U.S. and European and Canadian governments to allow. Uh, more Chinese project stakes in in some of those development projects. Um, I think you know if if the if you know that any one of those Namibian projects, the Chinese would be happy to buy a stake in or or, or buy themselves. Same with Niger, um, and I think that would be a strategic mistake because those pounds aren't going anywhere but China. And you know it does come down to Africa is a little bit more confidence on. The being able to be a bulk tonnage moving operation, right? It's not so much can I build a complex underground mine or a freeze wall or whatever. Uh, the mining itself is easy. You're just basically, you know, stripping out a paleo channel to, to uh, whatever 50 meters deep maximum type thing. Um, the challenge is how do I, um, you know, how do I save a percent here and a percent there and earn the margins, you know, and beneficiation, you know, Every ton I'm putting through a leach process or a heap leach or whatever is is a ton more of reagents that I need. It's more tailings disposal I need. You know, it's in a, in a, every ton I'm putting on a conveyor or, or a truck and moving is cost. You know, how do I do that? So that that's that sort of I think drawback there is is can I be almost a Fortescue? Can I move the impossible? Um, you know, remember Fortescue was low grade iron ore, massive bulk tonnage moving operation. And everybody said, there is no way in God's green earth, there's going to be a, a market for it and B, they're going to be able to do it. You know, Namibia is the same hundred PPM cutoff. Um, you know, it's going to be the same thing. Can I get the uranium out of this ore body without blowing dollars and dollars and dollars in moving the material to do so? Um, and, uh, and that's the reality, like with all the, the hype around Paladin and Langer Heinrich, that's a restart (laughs) or everything was already built. Um, yes, there's challenges in this, but you know, you've got the handful of guys in Namibia that are almost sort of hoping somebody else goes first, (laughs) you know, you know, can you prove it can, it can be done and then I'll jump in behind you. (laughs) Um, yeah, and I, well, it's, it's, I, we're going to I guess name check one of our favorites, you know, the, the Baron Boys. I think they just announced this morning they're raising 75, 76 million yeah. uh, Aussie of equity. Um, and they had, they had what? Yeah, 35 million or so in, in the bank already. So they're obviously priming themselves, setting themselves up. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
you know, timing. I'd love to understand the timing and what's the thinking. And maybe I'll speak to, uh, I've got a message from Brandon while we've been talking, saying perhaps he, he would Don't come on and talk about Don't listen to anything Keller's saying, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, no, he's, he's, trying, to, he's trying to arrange a, a, a wine uh, tour of our trip down to Adelaide in October. Excellent. Um, which, uh, which hopefully you will join us on. Global Uranium um, Conference. Uh, I'm there for the wine. Global and the conference. Uranium. I love it. It's not the Australian Uranium Conference. It's the Global Uranium Conference in Adelaide. When's that? Yeah. October 23rd, 24th. Be there or be square. Um, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then I think we're going to pop up for IMARC up in uh, Sydney yeah. so shortly after that, for sure. For sure. For sure. And um, yeah, like it, it, it's it's kind of um, N- Namibia is you know obviously as you say re- restarts and examples of companies that have have, have been there and done it yeah uh, for for sure uh, and I suspect some of the next calves off the rank will will come will come from there. Yeah, Who finances it? Who owns it is another matter. Yeah, and I that's don't, another conversation. As I said, I don't I don't mind that raise. I mean, you know, Brandon wants to 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 get a few things done on site, you know, and start. Making some preparation. I, I like that. He's been. It's, tra- it's Gavin Chamberlain there, right? Oh, sorry, Gav. That's the guy. Yeah. Gav, not Brandon. Yeah. Brandon's just directing traffic and and you know conducting there. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Gavin seems to know what he's doing. Yeah, no, he does. Not, the, not that Brandon didn't. That's like, that came out wrong. No, I say he seems to know what he's doing. So it's operation on the ground, which is what he's there for. I did for say sure. to, I did say to Brandon when we we uh, we were having Christmas drinks last December. I was over in Perth, and I uh, I said to him. Uh, after a few drinks, I said, you know, the market's got this perception that, you know, that you're not the guy to build this mine because you don't like to get your fingernails dirty. And when he announced uh, that the, the, with Gav coming in, I said, you know, look, with the fingernails coming, you could have just worn gloves. <laughs> I think you made the right call. And he <laughs> look, knows yeah, it. I think so. And, no, you know, he... yeah, Gav's, Gav's doing some good stuff and, and, and they want to get active on the ground. And there was a, obviously there was a site to a, a last month I think where there was um yeah yeah a bunch of yeah. Aussies and maybe some others went over and looked at at, at a whole, whole bunch of things in Namibia and uh, I sadly wasn't there um maybe I can get Didn't down get there the year oh, I got, oh, it was I got the it was invite it was just too hard to bag at work um, <laughs> same and same. Uh, <laughs> and um um but you know like I, I think everybody came back saying you know wow it, it it's not going to actually take much to, 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 you know, like these projects look like they want to be progressed. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that was sort of an important takeaway. You know, they'd seen Langer Heinrich and said, oh, yeah, okay, it works. There's a plant there, whatever. But then going and seeing and going, oh, okay, wow, that's a big long pit. You know, it's, it's all here. Okay. We, we, now we can see where he's planning on doing things. Um, yeah, so, it's, it's pretty. We went out there a couple of years ago and saw obviously Bat Bannerman and also Deep Yellow, like just you know, just around well, yeah. just up the road as it were. Um, they raised a ton of money, obviously earlier this year. Was it two hundred seventy odd? Yeah, yeah, exactly. About? Something like that. They're serious about yeah. moving this thing forward, and more importantly, the market thinks they're serious because they went and raised that without much effort. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I hope he's got that cash sitting in a super saver account right now, uh, earning some good interest. Well, there, there, there's there's a man who won't be able to find gloves to fit his hands. Uh, right, wish. True story, folks. True story. And, and here's one for you. Here's one for you. But yeah, because I'm subconscious of your time. It's, it's it's late on a on a, on an Australian evening, and you kindly joined us. So I don't want to take too much advantage of you too much. I do want to take advantage of you, but not too much. Um, which is, and I'm, I want to take the other side. Of a discussion, I, the, I think the Money Mind Boys did a great, really entertaining session a few weeks ago around a CEO. We're not going to name names because we're not that that kind of people who perhaps uh, took sold a bunch of stock, right? Like a lot of a lot of stock, right? And I think it's kind of important to kind of take look at both sides of the argument, which I'm not, I'm not sure the boys managed to to do that. It was all uh, blood and thunder and fury, which which is you know that's fine. It's all good. I think they're good boy. I, I really like that. Yeah. Um, but let's look at the other side of that coin, all right? Um, this isn't a defend this particular CEO. This is, uh, yeah, I've seen it before a few times. And, you know, it's very frustrating. But, you know, well, I tell you what, you, you go first. What, how, how do you call it? And I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably jump in with a few, with my bobber boots as well. So in that instance, uh, the first thing I did was get on the phone and congratulate him. Uh, so well done. Okay. Um, the second thing I said Why'd you was, say that? 
was, uh, you know, you've done amount, an amount that's meaningful to you and your family, uh, that it's, you know, just, just reward for all your hard work. And hopefully the market sees that as, as you're done and everything else stays and you won't be doing, you know, you, 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 you won't be selling again. Um, yeah. And you know, like, yeah, the market had a little bit of a hissy fit as, as lots of, uh, uh, institutional investors don't think that CEOs should be able to take the reward, although institutional investors can buy and sell whenever they feel uh, the, the the desire to. Um, and you know, it lasted two days, and it looked like it was going to bounce back. And uh, and you know, and unfortunately, you know, when you, when you then look at what happened in June, the rest of that stock price is in line with the sector, right? So the sector's rolled over and and got hammered. Um, you know, we we see tech CEOs who have never generated any value for shareholders who will do a secondary sell down against alongside a capital raise and, and everyone goes, Oh yeah, well that's just the tech sector. That's how they roll. Uh, and, and you go, okay, so, you know, this is a company where you've taken it from 30 million bucks to 2 billion. Um, you know, you've raised 400 million bucks and you've got a, two producing assets and $300 million in cash and equivalents. Then at any shareholder, that's a great result, right? So take the reward. Um, so, I, yeah, think I, so. I, I think so. I think so. That kind of you know, I, I think an initial knee jerk reaction for me was like, whoa, <laughs> like may, maybe that could have the timing could have been better. Maybe we could have. I should say, I think as an industry, I see make a good point there. Doing one lump sum, rip the plaster off rather than drip feed selling. Because I think that maybe that sounds like a worse message if, if you've got a CEO or directors in this case. Yeah. Every year you see, yeah. oh, I'm selling for tax reasons. It's like, but you haven't actually, the stock's done nothing. How do you have a tax bill on this? You, you know, like you've gone backwards. You're selling for tax, you know, selling for tax, yeah. selling for tax. And, you know, like there's a long list of, there's there's a long list of, even in uranium, a uh, long list of CEOs who've sold stock, who've done absolutely zero for shareholders. Uh, yeah. and, and they've been forgiven, um, that haven't, you know, never hit any milestones whatsoever. Um, there's a long list of companies, junior miners everywhere that are lift that are stuffing their pockets full of options and rock performance rights and, and incentives and stuff like this every year in AGMs and half the people are too lazy to go and look through the proxies to, to work out exactly how much it is. And no broker wants to quantify it because there might be a capital raise. I don't want to piss off that CEO by outing him for, wow. you know, for, for having all yeah. of this. Show me the incentive candy. and I'll show you the outcome. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. Like, the broker's not going to do anything to piss off potential, you know, uh, money-making fee, fee, fee day yeah. uh, for, for sure. But even like, yeah, okay, yeah, sticking with this kind of thing, the other side of the argument thing is like, I think it's probably unrealistic to expect a CEO to kind of sit there for seven 10 years, 15 years, and never sell a single share. Yeah. I, I think that's unrealistic, right? Because that's a lot of, you know, whilst, whilst we may think about it, you know, once a day or once a week, they're, 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 in, they're in this. I think they should, they pick up a salary. I don't think he pays himself particularly. No, it's middle of the range. Exorbitantly, middle does of the he? Range. No. Middle of the range, right? Yeah. He's, Right, so he's, he's a good guy from that point of view, and yeah. I know there's been no fun and games with him in terms of all the ways that some CEOs like to incentivize themselves, as you're yeah, alluding to. There's no, to. Con there's no consulting uh, gigs on the side. <laughs> right, right, no. <laughs> yes, let's not go there. Uh, so, so, I th so I think in terms of like taking money off the table, in this case of how do you take money off the table without saying, I'm taking everything out because I'm gone, is like leave enough in, which I think, you know, whatever that number looks like, because um, let's face it, us regular shareholders, we are taking money off the table the yeah, whole time. We're exactly making right. sure we're cashing in and, 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 and doing okay. But I, I, you know, maybe there's a little bit of, well, I don't want you, the directors, doing anything which might upset my ability to monetize this, you know, for my needs. <laughs> uh, so you can hold in there until this thing is built or sold. I don't, it's just not realistic, is it? No, no. no. And you know what? I was chatting to a bloke in Canada who was, who was jumping up and down a little bit about it, and uh, and uh, and I said to him, I said, look, I said, if 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 this was a, a North American company, that CEO would have taken two hundred million bucks out of the thing, you know, like the, the way they pay themselves. Yeah. I said, you know, yeah, it, it, it's uh, <laughs> it, 
it is what it is. Uh, I mean, look, I get asked I think as that, well. I get asked yeah. by investors, yeah. you know, have you ever taken money out of your fund? Uh, you know, and I'm like, wait on a second. I, I, I've got to live as well. Uh, and I, you know, I have tax bills that I, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny that investors think that they're the only ones that have the right to be able to take profit out of somebody else's hard work. Um, you know, but, uh, as I said, I, there's, I can think of without even blinking, I can think of three immediately, um, where CEOs sold stock and I was very unhappy because I didn't feel they'd achieved anything or given me any value. Yeah. Uh, in this particular yep. set of circumstances, I'm like, you made me a lot of money over overachieved. eight years. Um, you know, yeah, we've yeah. had a he's, massive he's overachieved. Return. So yeah, you know. Okay, well, like, look, I, I, I'm sure we could we could talk about that ad nauseum. <laughs> um, but uh, but and let's say I'm I, I'm you know I think I'm sure we're talking about it, but I'm I'm not going to. Yeah, like name names specifically, but I think in this case, this CEO is a, is, is a good guy. He's yeah. actually, you know, delivered. We've all made uh, money from that, and you know, he's allowed to take some money off the table, oh, yeah, uh, as well. Oh, okay, there we go. Job done. <laughs> right. Um, I th I think, uh, like I say, conscious of your time, time of night for you, you've probably got a few things you need need to do and get out of the way. Children to to uh, take orders from, uh, <laughs> I think like mine. And <laughs> um, it's a br brilliant shot, brilliant shot. I think it's it's super exciting as ever. I mean, forget the price, keep thinking the long, long, long term um, demand signals. And I think maybe everything's just going to be fine. And, you know, we're going to, as we're, as you know, we're coming into September is always the period where uranium kicks again and everything happens and we're going to see so lots of M&A, I reckon. I reckon there's still going to be a lot more. There's going to be a whole bunch of really bad things happening in that in, in M&A, and there's going to be a couple of good ones. <laughs> and uh, do you mean? Do you mean like I, I hear what you're saying? Do you mean there's going to be some some pointless M&A? Yeah. It's just yeah. distracting rather than being effective. Yeah, yeah. It's not going yeah, to give me okay. any value. It's not going to help me. It's going to maybe help their ETF flows or or whatever it is that they want. Um, it's not going to help them raise more capital. It's not going to help them drill, drill more effectively, and it's not going to help them. You know, uh, but we're going to see that because that seems to be uh, the easy thing to do. But I think we're going to see some really clever deals as well. Uh, and I think there's going to be some some teams you need to keep an eye on and watch uh, because they're going to be doing some good things. Because you know, the last cycle guys, they they know where they want to be and what they want to do, and they're. They're just waiting for the chess hear, pieces yeah. to move. I hear you. I, I think there's been a couple of kind of sl slow, slow moving uh, works in progress, which will probably start probably start to accelerate through the the, the phases because they're, they're they're putting in and piecing it together without the hoo ha promotional arm waving, which we see all too often. And I believe you know, don't get me wrong, that has kind of worked, but it's attracted a certain type of investor, and I think that's you know that's you know that's on them. Um, but I think in terms of where the the the, the big money is going to go, the and kind there's of there's a lot money of money that's trying to work out how to play in this sector. Yep, a lot yep. of money. Absolutely. You know, like there's and yeah. I mean the, 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 just a really quick aside, like the the move in say Constellation and some of these utilities in the US has been great because energy funds have been in there and they've made money, right? And they're now sitting there saying, why are we making money out of these? <laughs> Oh, because they've got nuclear power and, and, and all these data centers want the nuclear power. And, you know, so, uh, you know, there was some guys at a JP Morgan Energy Conference last year, uh, last week in New York, and uh, uranium guys, and they were being monstered by, by energy funds and energy investors saying, you know, tell us, you're, you're giving, the, you're making the stuff that's going to these nuclear power plants, giving us a, you know, a doubling in constellation. We think that's maybe run. We want to have a look down and see what we can play. And, you know, I said, uh, I think there's going to be a lot going on, a lot going on in the next six months. I, I agree. Yeah. I, I think it's also going to be a lot going on in the U.S. Because mm. I think there needs to be, a, I think someone has come here and do a roll up because there's, there's a bunch of poxy assets which are kind of stranded. Yeah. Um, I think we need some big names with a big balance sheet to actually come and do something. Obviously, I think, you know, Cameco are kind of well established in Wyoming, but. You, do they need the price to kind of move before they can do do more with that? Um, I'm I'm seeing the Canadians sniffing down the US because they've seen what some of these uh, new, these New York listings have done for for some yeah. for even for a couple of a couple of groups and access to that kind of New York NYSE uh, generalist fund is feeling quite attractive for the moment. So yeah. let's 
Let's review <laughs> near the time. So I'm going to see, are you going to come to London for a WNA? Or are you going to stick with Adelaide? It depends. It depends. Um, you know, if I've got some performance and I'm making investors money again, I could probably justify the travel. Um, it's very unlike the Macquarie days where you just traveled and, and didn't worry about it. You know, when it's, when it's your money and your investors money. Um, and you know, also, uh, if I do do it, I'd like to go via Namibia and that requires Brandon to, uh, to pony up on the, on the, on the, the, uh, safari he's been promising me for eight years. So, uh, he, he, I, 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 I did that and he did not pony up. <laughs> there was no, there were no ponies present in that trip. <laughs> Muggins here picked up every, every single bit. Clearly some of the dinners. I'm not expecting the, you the pay. I'm just expecting you to organize it for me. <laughs> oh, he might organize. He's a very good organizer. Uh, also a beautiful country as well. <laughs> should I, should I say, yeah. get, get yourself down there. So, okay. Well, I'm going to love you and leave you. I'll speak to you real soon. Okay. No problems. Thanks for having me.